Okay, so thanks for coming, and uh, Thierry, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm just in Milan for a day, so it seems really nice so far. So, um, yeah, I've, I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, some of the work we and others have been doing about developing single cell technologies that allow us to look not just at the transcriptome of a single cell, but to integrate that data with other levels of information from the same single cell. So, it's almost... Um, unnecessary to give an introduction to single cell genomics. Now everyone's, everyone's doing it, everyone's very interested in doing it and applying it to lots of different uh, scenarios, but I'll have a short introduction about why we do single cell genomics. And the textbook answer is, of course, that cells are the universal building blocks of life. And I guess we're at a human genomics or genetics conference, so a lot of the tissues and, and cells that people would be interested in would be on the right-hand side of the screen, so blood and developmental systems, um, and gut as well. But also, these technologies can be applied across the spectrum of living systems. Because everything is made of cells, we can use single-cell technologies to reveal different levels of information about everything from plants to microbial life, as well as developmental systems and disease systems as well. And actually, because of, because of where our institute is situated, we work up with a lot of plant biologists as well as microbial biologists, and trying to apply these technologies right across the spectrum. So currently, with our genomics approaches, we, we explore the sum of the parts. We take something kind of complex like this, a lot of blood cells, and, and treat them as an individual or as one sample. We take all of the complexity you might find in a, in a Lego set where there's lots of different pieces with different colors, different shapes, that contribute to different levels of the phenotype of the overall organism. So there's lots of heterogeneity, not just in the phenotype of the cells, but the functional role that they play within the overall organism. And when we do this with conventional genomics, we basically just converge everything into a single, very boring, very gray Lego brick, and we lose all of that information about what was making the system actually work, how the genomes in the individual cells were being um, expressed, and how they were being sort of activated to create these phenotypes. So what we wanted to do with single cell is obviously then reveal all of those um, different layers of information that are in there and to, to go back and be able to determine all of this complexity. And over the last four or five years, there's been a massive increase in the number of single cells that people um, analyze in a single cell experiment. So I think really it's the, the emergence of droplet-based technologies uh, such as 10x genomics, which allow people to, to now process not just hundreds of cells, but thousands and even millions of cells. And it's been a clear trajectory from, from a couple of years ago where, where four or 5,000 cells would have been an enormous experiment through to six, uh, 60, 70,000 through, through to 1.3 million cells in a data set that 10x have, have released. Um, these, are, these are huge numbers of cells enabling us to, to look at very complex systems and take them apart into uh, their individual cell types. What's important to remember that all of these conclusions about cell types that people are drawing are based on very limited amounts of uh, information per cell. So, so we're, in the case of this 1.3 million cell data set, it's, it's about uh, 18,000 reads, sequencing reads per cell. So it's enough to cluster different cell types, but it's really not enough to start telling you about the functional, the mechanisms within the cell. Um, and, and really understanding regulatory mechanisms, I, I think, at least. And the trajectory is definitely going over to the, to the right here. So it's really, you know, people are very interested in doing whole organism sequencing and human cell atlases and things, which are very important work. But it's also important to think about the other end of the spectrum, which um, I've gone the wrong way, uh, where we want to take very rare cells or cells that we really want to study in depth, um, hundreds or thousands maybe of them, and understand as much as we absolutely can about them. So to really look in detail, um, maybe just deeper transcriptome sequencing, so maybe more than uh, 18,000 reads per cell, maybe keep sequencing the transcriptome until we understand more about splicing. Um, whole genome sequencing is, uh, is still sort of lagging behind the transcriptome sequencing in a way that, because it's harder, I think. Um, but it's also um, much more relevant, obviously, in, in, in cases of somatic variation. Um, what I'll be talking about today is this uh, parallel sequencing of genomes and transcriptomes where we try and get the genome and the transcriptome from the same single cell. And something else that we're working quite a bit on now is, is because a lot of the droplet-based single cell sequencing methods just look at three prime tag sequencing or, or incomplete coverage of the transcript, we want to understand more about splicing in single cells and to use long read sequencing to interpret 
uh, isoforms, which isoforms of which genes are expressed at the single cell level. And this is something at the moment that is definitely restricted to just looking at uh, hundreds or thousands of cells. But I'll talk today about this GNTC protocol that Thierry, Chris, and I put together when I was at, at Sanger. Um, and it's really a platform, and I hope I'll show you in the next couple of slides, that it's a platform for multi-omic pro profiling that we've been able to build additional platforms on top of. And it's a pretty useful tool, I think, for lots of different applications across the biological spectrum. So why would we want to do this? Well, obviously there's a fairly complex but, but well understood, or reasonably well understood relationship between the uh, genome and the transcriptome at the cellular level. Um, and in, in particular, I think the focus when we were developing this method was, was that it would be an, applied in, in uh, cancer or cases where there was large chromosomal variation, uh, copy number variation in single cells and heterogeneity at that level that could be reflected in heterogeneity in the transcriptome. And we wanted to use it and develop a method that would enable us to understand the relationship between genomic copy number variation and uh, gene expression. So at the genome level, we can see that um, uh, we, 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 we might be able to correlate, uh, sorry, yeah, correlate gene expression with uh, changes in chromosome copy, copy number. But if we look more deeply, we may be able to sequence deeper both in the genome and transcriptome and understand things like rearrangements. So what, what, what fusion transcripts do we detect at the single cell level and how, how can they be correlated with fusions in the genome? And at the deepest level, and probably the hardest, definitely the hardest level in single cell analysis is linking single nucleotide variation in the genome with single nucleotide variation in the transcriptome. Um, in part, we can use single cell transcriptome data as the copy number is much, much higher uh, to validate uh, single cell genome, uh, single nucleotide variation, uh, as there's only a copy number of two in normal cells. So, so it, it can be helpful in that way, but this is still very, very difficult. Um, so most of the work really focuses on the first two, so copy number variation, detecting changes in the genome and the chromosomal copy number uh, and, and how they manifest themselves in changes in expression, and then looking at rearrangements and how we can detect tran uh, fusion transcripts and the genomic rearrangements that generate them. So the method is, is actually pretty simple. So we isolate cells. Uh, almost uh, entirely by fax, but we can do it manually as well. And there's one case I'll show where we did it manually. Uh, put them in lysis buffer, cells lies. We can add these ERCC spike in molecules if we want to understand a little bit more about the technical variation in the method. But the lysis is quite harsh. The cells release all of their genomic DNA and mRNA. Um, and we assume we're getting rid of all the nucleosomes and really destroying the cell, uh, but releasing uh, intact or uh, reasonable quality mRNA and DNA, D genomic DNA. We then perform a physical separation, and that's really the, the, the key to the method. It's just a careful physical separation based on oligo-DT-based uh, capture of mRNA and careful washing and then uh, precipitation of the uh, supernatant, uh, which contains the genomic DNA. And we end up with effectively two tubes for every sample or two wells in every plate, one for mRNA and one for genomic DNA. And then we can perform pretty much whatever amplification methods we would like on those. Uh, the way we've designed it is it directly goes into a modified version of the SMART-C2 protocol for the uh, cDNA amplification. And for the genomic DNA amplification, we have a choice really because we have DNA on beads just purified. We can run any method that we'd like to run. So, so depending on what we want to do, we have a choice of uh, any, any method that's out there, really. But the ones we worked with were uh, uh, multiple displacement amplification using 529 uh, and Picoplex uh, from the kit from, uh, I can't remember who owns it now, but it was, it's a P sort of PCR-based amplification method. And then there's a number of things we can do with that amplified material. Obviously, this, the most straightforward thing to do is prepare an Xterra library from our cDNA and our, uh, or our amplified cDNA and from our amplified genomic DNA and, and just sequence that. And with that, we can look at expression level uh, in the genome and we can look at copy number and in principle look right down to base level uh, events, although the dropout is quite high as with any single cell genomic DNA amplification method. Um, 
but as I said, we've also got an interest in splicing and, and looking at um, in more detail. And so the cDNA that we generate, uh, as with any cDNA coming from the SMART C2 method, is full-length cDNA. And we can use that to generate libraries for PacBio using something very close to their ISOSeq protocol. And this enables, it enables us not just to quantify transcripts, but to look at the, the variants in um, the isoform, uh, the splicing variants that are present in the cell as well. So we can get both of those data sets from the transcriptome material. Uh, and then from the genome, depending on which method we've cho chosen for whole genome amplification. So MDA is typically better for uh, preserving the, the, the base level events, so single nucleotide variation in the cell, but less good at preserving copy number variation across the genome. So we would use that in an instance where we, we maybe wanted to do targeted sequencing or even qPCR for genotyping of the cells. Um, but if we want to look at genome-wide copy number of picoplex is superior in, on that front, so uh, while being inferior on the capture of uh, base level events due to the higher error rate of the enzymes used. So once we've made that choice, we can choose what we want to, to look at in the genome. We can do targeted sequencing or we can do copy number um, variant calling. So that's the example that we used to sort of demonstrate how the method works, how well the method works, was really uh, just using, using cancer cell lines, or well, at least a cancer cell line and a lymphoblastoid cell line from the same original donor. So we used the HCC38 uh, breast cancer epithelial cell line. So you can see from its karyotype, it's really very massively messed up, a lot of rearrangements, a lot of copy number changes. And probably if we were doing this again, we may have chosen a slightly simpler, simpler cell line to work with. Um, but it's, it was a good test for this because it's very complex in terms of its karyotype. Um, and then we have obviously the cells from the same donor, which is the HCC38 BL cell line here. And you can see its karyotype is pretty normal. Um, so we have effectively a case and a control in our, in our, um, in our experimental setup. As I said, we fact sorted these cells into 96 well plates. And then uh, I think the majority of the work in, in developing this protocol was the automation of this careful separation of DNA and RNA. And we did this using this robot, a Beckman robot, but you can use pretty much any relatively complex liquid handling robot. Um, and it's not that hard to set up. So we went through and did the amplification and the library prep for those two. Uh, those two cell lines all on the same plate. So each experiment had both cells sorted onto the same plate. So we knew that we, we should be avoiding at least any batch effects. And uh, so these are just the DNA copy number profile. On, on the left, sorry, is the DNA copy number profile of the uh, cells that we sequenced. And so we used picoplex for this and then just sequenced them and, and then just looked at copy number, copy number variation. So you can see, first of all, um, it's, it's just uh, a heat map that's uh, ordered in terms of chromosomes. So down the left-hand side, you have chromosome one, two, three, and so on. Then the next column in here, you have just the bulk sequencing. So what the copy number calling looks like when you sequence bulk HCC38 cells um, using conventional sequencing approaches. And you can see, just like the karyotype, it's very complex, very messed up. A lot of copy number gains in green and a lot of copy number losses in red. Then if we move across the heat map into the single cells, these are all individual HCC38 cells. And you can see that the copy number profile in general reflects pretty well the bulk. Uh, it's very hard to uh, call individual differences in this that are distinct from the bulk. Maybe that there's you know, heterogeneity within the population because it's so complex. But we can see that overall it reflects the bulk pretty well. Um, so we were happy with that. And then on the right-hand side, this, this part of the the heat map is all very dark, which is copy neutral. So this is copy number two. So this is the HCC38 BL cells, which obviously, or in principle, should have a copy number of two. And you can see the, the keen eyed amongst you may see that there's a, a small patch of green here, suggesting that some of the cells may have a trisomy in actually chromosome 11. Um, but uh, I'll come to that in a minute. The Right-hand side, we have the transcriptome data from the same cells. So this is again exactly the same cells, and we can see that there's a, a distinct gene expression pattern that distinguishes the two cell types, which is not unexpected. They're two very different cell types from two different, very different tissues. Um, so it's, it's, it's from a biological perspective not that interesting, but from a technical perspective, we were pretty sure that we were separating uh, uh, a breast cancer epithelial cell in, in terms of its uh, gene expression profile versus something that looked a little bit like a B cell in the, 
in the HCC38 EL cells. And we can detect quite a lot of genes per cell in this, in this sort of setup. So we can detect in each of these cell lines between seven and 10,000 genes were expressed per individual cell. So we get a pretty good transcriptome and we get a pretty good genome from, from this method. So I mentioned a little bit about fusion, so I'll talk a little bit about this in this first case study that I have on, on GNT-seq. Um, so we were interested in using uh, not just uh, the Nextera Illumina sequencing pro program to, 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 to look at alternative splice or to look at fusion transcripts in these cells. And we know because it's a, this, the HCC38 uh, is this cancer cell line and we have all these genomic rearrangements, we knew there should be some fusion transcripts that we might find. So we, we sort of scoured the, the Illumina-based uh, single cell RNA sequencing data from the GNT-seq for potential fusion transcripts and identified one of interest, well, we identified a few of interest, but one sort of, uh, sort of easy, easier to characterize target, um, which was a fusion between uh, exon six of this, this uh, MTAP uh, gene, which is on chromosome nine, and uh, exon three of PCDH7, which is on chromosome four. And we had reads in our single cell RNA data that mapped just across this, this exon, exon boundary. So we gave us some confidence that this fusion transcript was there. Um, we then went to look for the fusion in the genome that was giving rise to this. And because we have the DNA from the same single cell amplified sitting in the freezer, we can do lots of different tests to see whether that fusion is detectable. We started out first trying to do long range PCRs and nothing really worked. Uh, in the end, we, we resorted to very, very deep sequencing of a few cells, uh, of the genomes of a few cells to, uh, and by very deep, I mean 30X coverage, but for a single cell, that's quite deep. Um, we, we, so in three of the four cells we detest, uh, that we did, did this to, we detected reads passing across a fusion point that would have sat in between those two exons. So we um, found a chromosome nine, chromosome four fusion, in the same cells that we'd found the fusion transcript in, we were able to sequence across the breakpoint. And I think the reason the long range PCRs weren't working is because the distance is very, very far, actually surprisingly far. It's, uh, it's uh, 100,000 base pairs or more between the, the two exons in terms of the genome fusion. So it's really a very strange transcript. But we, at least we found something that resembles the fusion site that, that links these two exons. And as I mentioned a little bit, the, the kind of the way the technology is going and the way we are interested in, in looking at these things is not just using Illumina sequencing and looking for you know, a small amount of reads, short reads that fit across a breakpoint, but actually using long read sequencing technology to sequence from end to end of, of transcripts. And this is particularly useful in this case where we have uh, full length cDNA and uh, you know, this is the kind of data we get from Illumina, it's short reads with you know, a little bit of mapping across from one side of, of, of an exon or one exon to another. With PacPyre, this looks just like a drawing, but it's actually a, the only way we can visualize the reads with uh, any, any sort of, um, well, make it easy to represent the reads. And um, these are reads that go end to end in the transcript, and we can use that in parallel with the Illumina data to assemble um, a pretty accurate representation of the, what, the, what the fusion transcript looks like in terms of its sequence, and even determine that it's in frame and potentially a coding transcript. So we can, when we go this deep, we can get a lot of extra information that you would just completely miss if you did something just by 10x. Um, so the second uh, case study, we're back to our uh, little um, trisomy 11 cells. So as, as I mentioned the, in, the, in the previous slide, some of our normal cells actually had something that looked a little bit like a trisomy 11 in them. And we we're wondering, is this just an error in the method or is this a real subclone? So there was four cells that had this uh, trisomy 11 in the DNA data. And uh, we did some interface fish. Uh, and of, of basically when we did that, about two and 100 cells appeared to actually have a trisomy 11. So we gained some confidence that this was a real occurrence, that this is a real subclone in our normal cells. And this chart is a little bit complicated, but all it really shows is that as you go across the chromosomes, in the cells where we had a gain in uh, chromosome 11, we see much, much higher expression of the genes across uh, chromosome 11. So and, uh, as an aggregate, the, the chromosome is, is more active, well, the chromosome is more abundant in the cell, therefore there's more chromosome 11 related activity in the cell. 
So the, the, the cool thing about having the GNT seq sort of set up is that we have the transcriptome as well. So, so when we look at those genes that are elevated in the single cells, we can screen through for anything that might allow us to enrich for that subclone. And we did that by looking for um, well, any gene that was expressed, uh, overexpressed uh, as a result of, of um, having trisomy 11. And uh, one gene stood out in that it's uh, uh, basically a surface marker. It may enable us to fax the cells and enrich the, uh, the subclone. So ESAM1, which is expressed on stem cells and all sorts of other things, uh, is on chromosome 11. And it's, uh, when you have trisomy 11, it seems to be expressed a little bit higher. And we were able to separate out an ESAM positive and ESAM negative population based on the antibody. And we were able to enrich 100% posit positive trisomy 11 cells versus normal cells. So we could go back using the genomic data, or from the genomic data to the transcriptomic data, to then identify a phenotype that allowed us to sort for the genome, uh, the, the genotype effectively. So, uh, yep, this is just showing the same thing that the Trisome, the trisomy 11 genes are more highly expressed, or the chromosome 11 genes are more highly expressed in trisomy 11. So that's kind of an interesting application, but I can think one of the more, most interesting applications uh, in, the, in these sort of small case studies, at least, is our, is our first attempt at looking at a real in vivo system, which was uh, the study of mouse embryos at the eight cell stage. So we wanted to look at aneuploidies and the effect that whole chromosome gains and losses would have on the transcriptome of individual cells. So we took mouse embryos as a, as a model system. Thierry had done some work with them before. And uh, with Magdalena zeneca goetz in Cambridge, we, we, we started looking at treating um, eight or four cell stage uh, mouse embryos with a compound called reversine that causes chromosomal missegregation. And we sort of anticipated that if we treat the embryos at the four cell stage with this, we start to see cells within the daughter cells at the eight cell stage with chromosome copy number gains and chromosome copy number losses. And hopefully they'd be reciprocal because that would, that's the, you know, that would make sense. And that's exactly what we saw. So in the reversing treated embryos um, at the eight cell stage, so this is just a, a sort of circularized heat map, just like the previous one where red means a copy number loss and green means a copy number gain. Uh, we have eight, eight cells on this sort of axis. So just along here, there's eight cells. And it's just chromosome one, two, and so on around. And you can see when we get to chromosome four, there's a red band and a green band. So it's a cell that has a, a trisomy and a cell that has a, a monosomy of uh, chromosome four. And if we go a little bit further around, we see on another chromosome, there's also uh, a similar reciprocal gain and loss. It's the other way around this time. And then another one in the, uh, for, further along in the same two cells. And then we have another pair of cells in, uh, in, uh, on chromosome 14, I think, that have a, a, another reciprocal gain and loss. And our control embryo, where we have no reversing treatment, we see everything's black the whole way around, apart from the X chromosome, because this is a female mouse and this is a male mouse. Uh, so yeah. So we ended up at least being able to identify two sister cell sets in this uh, pool of eight cells. Um, cell three and cell five had kind of a relatively complex uh, relationship in terms of how they inherited their chromosomes. So we have uh, trisomy 10, monosomy 17, and monosomy four in cell five, and then the reciprocal trisomies and monosomies in cell three, its sister cell. And then in cell seven and cell eight, we have trisomy 13 and monosomy 13. So there's a very likely events that happen during a single cell division, and this would have been the cells were sampled not long after that cell division. So what happens to gene expression? So again, it's a reasonably complex plot. It's just an aggregate of gene expression in our control and uh, reverse and treated embryos across chromosomes. Um, so if we look at where the cells that have the copy number gains and losses are, we can see that cell three and cell five, which had uh, reciprocal gain and loss, of chromosome four, you can see that cell three, which had the gain of um, chromosome four, has elevated expression of all genes across chromosome four, and cell five has reduced relative to the mean. And the same pattern is true for all the other gains and losses we saw across, across in the different cells. And that's in a way really interesting because this, these are cells that have literally just inherited that extra chromosome and already they're expressing 
approximately half as much again of, uh, if they have a trisomy. So it, instantly within, within uh, after the cell division, this, this chromosome is already very active and uh, you know, producing extra copies of this, its genes within the cell. So a lot of work since has really gone into, and I should say that this is all sort of, sort of toy examples of how the method works. If anyone wants to see some really brilliant examples of how the method's working, talk to Thierry afterwards. He's got some really exciting data, which maybe <laughs> he wants to share, I don't know, but maybe he has already. But uh, so Thierry's really been applying this in really exciting systems. Um, I'm just showing some textbook examples of how it works. Um, so a lot of work since has gone into kind of expanding the multiomic repertoire. Um, we really wanted to understand if we could look at regulatory systems as well as expression using this kind of platform. And at the first thing that we stumbled across, or that we decided to, to pursue even, was uh, looking at methylation of, of DNA and uh, comparing it, or at least in, in, in integrating that with transcriptome level data. So obviously there's, there's known interactions between uh, methylation in, in, in the genome, DNA methylation and uh, gene expression, um, but, and, and a lot of developments had ha at this point had happened in terms of uh, tools for single cell profiling of, of, of single cell epi epigenomes. So uh, with Wolf Reich's group, we started looking at um, using their single cell bisulfide sequencing approaches on the DNA that we purified using the, GNA, the GNT seq method. Because um, as you remember, we just have DNA sitting on beads in a tube, we can pretty much do any enzymatic treatment that we would want to. So we effectively modified the protocol to, uh, instead of doing uh, whole genome amplification, we did bisulfide conversion and whole genome amplification, and then again did Illumina sequencing. So really a very minor change to the protocol, but it enabled us to start to look at the relationship between gene expression, in this case in iPSCs, I think, or no, in, sorry, in mouse embryonic stem cells, um, and, and methylation, now, the problem with single cell bisulfide sequencing is bisulfide treatment is very, very destructive to the DNA. So you, obviously you're starting with a limited copy number, ideally, well in a normal cell, two copies, and maybe, um, so, so you really don't have, a, um, you have a lot of opportunities to lose the material that you want to sequence, first of all, just in terms of dropout, that would happen with any enzymatic treatment, but also in terms of the bisulfide treatment of the DNA. Uh, so you lose a lot of material, it doesn't, it then, therefore it doesn't really enable you to look at base level methylation, but you can look at methylation of promoter regions or gene bodies or, or sort of larger regions in the genome. And then over a, a, um, with a collection of cells, you can start to look at the frequency of methylation in those regions and, and perhaps not use, use kind of an aggregate of the single cell data to look at populations within, within cells and, and how the methylation changes in those populations. Um, at, at these sort of larger loci. Um, but yeah, what we, what we were able to do with this is to, to look across the genome at methylation, to correlate that with uh, expression of genes, uh, nearby genes, and see if there was a link between expression and methylation at the single cell level. Again, this was just tested in some mouse embryonic stem cells. I think it would be quite interesting to look at how it performs in uh, more complex systems, like, like actual um, primary cells. Uh, but, but the principle is there that we were able to show correlations between uh, methylation at certain loci and uh, expression. And since then, uh, Wolf's group have gone on and uh, adapted the methods to capture three aspects of, of, the, of cellular omics. So, so not just the transcriptome, but also methylation and incorporating chromatin, chromatin accessibility. And they've done this by adapting uh, the GnomeSeq method, which uses a GPC methylase to methylate GPC within the genome. And then you finish with DNA that's GPC methylated. It obviously still has a CPG methylation from, from when it was in the cell. Uh, you perform bisulfide conversion, and then you can distinguish the areas of the genome that were reached by your GPC methylase, so the open chromatin. And then you can add in the data from your CPG methylation from the bisulfide conversion and get an overview of not just the transcriptome, but, but methylation and chromatin accessibility from the single cell. And again, this is not a, not a significant change from the overall protocol, at least. The, um, the method is, is reasonably easy, easy to adopt once you have the GNT-seq protocol up and working. So this is really cool that people are going on developing more 
aspects to this technology and, and using the platform to, to kind of uh, develop pretty exciting new tools, I think. So um, we'll, I, th I think there's some other developments in, in the works as well. So uh, hopefully it'll continue to develop, yeah. And by linking uh, expression and methylation, they were able to, to uh, sort of integrate these three levels of cellular omics. And you can understand that this probably gets quite complex at this point to really piece together uh, how methylation, chromatin accessibility, and expression interact. Even in a bulk sample, that's hard, but in a single cell sample, you have all sorts of population dynamics and things as well. But I think while it's hard, this is where the technology is gonna get really exciting and it's gonna really sort of uh, allow us to infer some rules of how cells actually work and how, how these three layers interact in, in a much more um, well, cell-focused kind of approach than, than just doing it in bulk samples or, or integrating data. By actually doing it on the same cell at the same time, I think we'll start to see some really complex properties of cells emerge. So in terms of what's next, so the pr proliferation of single cell technologies is phenomenal. I think over the last five or six years, it's gone from being sort of a hobby activity for some researchers to being completely mainstream and everyone seems to be pretty well versed in, in the technology now, uh, at least from the commercial suppliers, but also from, uh, from across the spectrum, there's, uh, there's people developing a lot of tools for everything. And when we, when we started with this, it was really uh, a little bit of single cell transcriptome data was sufficient to get you a nature paper and then uh, single cell genome data was, was lagging considerably far behind, far behind, but still was, was, was very applicable. I think it's still lagging behind in terms of technology development. Um, but the real proliferation has been on the other side of the diagram in epigenome profiling. As I mentioned, there's all these assays for chromosome accessibility or chromatin accessibility. Uh, chromosome conformation and base modifications, and in proteomics as well. So while direct mass spectrometry and analysis of proteins that way in single cells is still, it's, it's been demonstrated, but I wouldn't say it's uh, quite mainstream yet. There's been huge advances in uh, tagging antibodies with uh, metal ions for things like Cytof, uh, or with oligos for uh, integrating them with uh, single cell RNA sequencing approaches. And that's, uh, that's really exciting to see all of the layers of, of cellular omics starting to converge towards OmniSeq, I guess. And um, yeah, so there's lots of methods emerging. There's some that integrate methylation, DNA copy number, and transcriptome sequencing. And as I mentioned, the uh, SCMMT-seq and the NMT-seq methods for doing accessibility-based modifications and transcription sequencing. I didn't talk about this much about the, the site-seq methods, but those are the kind of methods that integrate antibodies tagged with oligonucleotides um, and enable you to read out both protein level and transcript level at the single cell, uh, in individual cells, using droplet-based platforms. Um, so yeah, but what's really next, I think, is, and I think it's what's gonna be discussed in the next talk, is how do you take all this information and uh, sort of put it back into a spatial context. And I think that's the next big challenge for single cell genomics, apart from continuing to develop the methods and make them even more robust. I think the big conceptual challenge is, is how do we take single cell genomics data and put it back into a spatial context? And we're back to our Lego set here. So this is the kind of thing we get at the end of a single cell study, a complex mixture of cells that we separated out using principal components and also t SNE plots. And we can tell the difference between different cell types, and that's great. We can learn something about the cell cellular systems that way. But what we really want to understand and where we really start to have fun is when we can build these things back into cellular systems and understand how the cells work together to make a, a, an organism with a phenotype. Um, and that's kind of the next big challenge. For us, we've started applying methods like the GNT-seq method to uh, try and understand uh, gene expression and DNA methylation in parallel in the chick embryo. We're using this really just because it's quite a nice uh, system for, for us because it, it has these linearly arranged somites that we can section uh, into sort of 10 micron sections and using a, an approach just like uh, the tomography sequencing that um, was published a few years ago by Alexander van Oudenarden. Um, we can perform GNT-seq on these sections, or, or uh, SC, M, and T-seq, so to look at transcri transcription, but also methylation in the individual sections, and we can start to map out how gene expression changes across um, a complex tissue, um, a complex developmental tissue. We're very early on with this, but I think this is one approach we can use these methods uh, to, to sort of uh, 
take something uh, more than a single cell to, to sort of do some spatial resolution of, of gene expression and methylation. Um, yeah. So in conclusion, I think the main conclusion, I guess, that I, I, I'd like to get across is that by separating DNA and RNA, just using something like this GNTC protocol, we, we're quite a powerful tool to interrogate, not just single cells, but sort of mini bulk samples, like the sections I just mentioned, um, and getting the same information from, from you know, the same single cell. And with continued development, I think these methods could really uh, start to reveal multiple layers of, uh, of, of the omics of single cells. So we could start to integrate very confidently uh, methylation data and chromatin data, expression data, and I would hope one day we'll be able to integrate spatial information with this as well and start to build complex models of living systems in three dimensions. So that's all I have to say. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone, first of all Thierry and uh, Chris Ponting who were really uh, drove, drove me to <laughs> develop the GNT seq method when I was at Sanger. Um, my current group, uh, Ashley, Laura, and Jim, uh, Wilfried, who's worked with us very closely on the bioinformatics of, of the GNT-seq method for years, now since we, it's really since we started, and uh, Harveen, Yang, Tim, and Mabel, who are also involved at Sanger. And uh, from the Babraham Institute, so we've worked quite closely with Wolf, Wolf Reich and Gavin Kelsey's group on the development of the MNT-seq method, as well as Christoph and uh, Oliver at the uh, EBI in Hingston. So yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Any questions?